Okay. My name is Miranda Lowry. I use she, her pronouns. Um, if you know Joe Lowry, my dad, I am his greatest creation um, right after all of the directed energy cyber weapons he's been working on. So um, that's to say I am his daughter and uh, he told me about Tech Confluence and I've come along to a couple of your meetings, um, but this is the first time that I'm speaking. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I studied anthropology and archeology span at the University of Oxford for my undergraduate and then archeology span for my masters. And I'm here to talk to you today about cyborg theory, post-humanism, cyborg feminism, and multi-species anthropology, um, which are all my favorite things in the world to talk about, just about. Um, as I mentioned, I don't have a career in uh, science or technology, but um, I did study anthropology and we have uh, a different perspective on technology from what I believe you in the um, like coding, programming, um, technology, like hands-on kind of field, uh, a different perspective from what you might have um, on it. So when you hear cyborg, we all tend to think of the human enhanced by technology in one way or another with bionic eyes or um, bionic limbs or superhuman memory in one way or another enhanced by technology to become more than they are uh, or more than they could be just from their kind of bodies. But in anthropology, we have a different perspective on cyborgs, a different way of defining technology, a different way of defining what it is to be human and what it is to be cyborg. Um, and all of this kind of, the main thinker in all of this is Professor Donna Haraway. Um, she's now retired, but she wrote for many, many years on the subjects of multi-species anthropology, post-humanism, uh, cyborg feminism. Also, she grew up in Colorado and went to my old high school. So that's really cool, I think. Um, but Professor Donna Haraway is one of the kind of capstone authors in this field. Uh, we'll get more into her particular ideas later, but first I want to give you kind of a background for the philosophical frameworks that surround this whole discussion and questions of what it is to be human, what it is to be technology. Um, and what it is to meld the two. So um, starting out, we have humanism, which uh, is the oldest of the kind of approaches to this uh, problem that we have. Uh, pictured on the screen is the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. And humanism is the kind of accompanying philosophy that posits that humans alone are capable of incredible things that we are not in need of divine intervention or technological intervention, that humans solely with our human faculties, our, um, our kind of minds and our bodies unaltered are able to fend for ourselves and achieve uh, wonderful things. And in itself, this is a great philosophy that I completely agree with, but, in the modern world, now that we have the realities of um, technology being so enmeshed in our lives, uh, it falls a little bit flat. So next up, we have transhumanism, uh, which started coming about, really came into its own in the 1990s. Um, transhumanism is the idea that we can use technology to our benefit to expand the boundaries of human consciousness, to uh, improve our bodies, to overcome the various illnesses and diseases of age, of, um, you know, infirmity, and uh, kind of hack our bodies by um, exploiting our natural biological mechanisms and enhancing them with, um, with technology. So along with transhumanism, we get um, like body hacking, we get um, people doing cryogenic freezing to hopefully reawaken uh, in a brighter technological future and uh, very sci-fi, very cyberpunk. Um, that's all transhumanism. And it very much capitalizes as well on the idea like humanism of humans being 
capable of bettering ourselves, furthering ourselves, making our minds better all through technology, viewing technology as kind of an extension of, of humanity overcoming our biological weaknesses. And then we have posthumanism, which is what I'm here to talk to you most about today. Posthumanism recognizes that humans and technology are not the only inhabitants of the planet, that we also have animals, we also have the microbiological world, we also have plants. And it's very much fueled by the climate crisis, the, um, the recognition that we are all very much in the same boat uh, when it comes to the warming of the planet and uh, we can't necessarily get ourselves out of the mess that we've created um, just by using machines. So posthumanism much more recognizes the idea that humans are not necessarily the best thing in the world, that we're not the pinnacle of evolution, that there are other modes of being conscious, of being intelligent and sentient, that there are other modes of thinking and feeling belonging to animals, belonging to plants, um, and all kind of emerging together in a constant process of negotiating and renegotiating what it is to live on Earth. Um, and all of this brings us to the question of what is human? And I've been throwing around the term uh, human and the term technology a lot. And uh, these are terms that it makes sense kind of reflexively to define as, well, I'm a human, you're a human, this is all obvious. And technology, we're using technology, I'm speaking to you alone in my bedroom, uh, yet you can all hear me through the magic of technology. Um, but in anthropology, the study of humans, uh, when you really think about these terms, it becomes increasingly difficult to define what is human, what is technology, where to draw the line between the two. Um, and these are questions that don't really have answers. Uh, every author has a different perspective on them. But um, I'd like, if we have time at the end, to kind of open the floor to have a discussion about how we all define what counts as technology, what counts as human, at what point do we have a melding of the two, also called the singularity, has it already started, um, all of that good stuff. Know that in anthropology, technology is defined not just as computers or machines, it also counts um, like writing, stone tools, farming, domestication, all of these are early instances of technology, as well as certain thought patterns, a particular set of skills, um, you know, a learned trade is a form of technology that by learning you're incorporating into your brain. Um, so I, I'd like if we can to all kind of think about the ways that we use technology that are not just um, machines, but also beyond that. Um, and all of this brings us to cyborgs, uh, Professor Donna Haraway's uh, kind of model of how she defines what it is to be human and more than human. There are lots of different ways to be cyborg. A cyborg, you'll notice org, comes from organism. And psi, uh, the, the prefix is essentially together. So the idea that Donna Haraway comes up with is a cyborg um, is a human plus something else, or not even necessarily a human. It could be uh, any, any two or more distinct entities that come together in a kind of symbiosis to form something more than either one on its own. So on the screen pictured, we have all sorts of examples of ways that humans can be cyborgs. We have body modifications, uh, someone with an insulin pump, someone with a prosthetic leg. Um, we have a kid looking at an iPad, uh, <laughs> all sorts of different ones. We have a police dog. In that instance, the dog and the police officer are functioning as one unit. Um, and there are infinite more examples of these. You'll notice the COVID vaccines as well are in there. Um, 
because that's a way of enhancing our body's natural immunity by um, working in tandem with a, a defunct version of the virus. Um, there are all sorts of different ways to be cyborg. And um, all of these, Professor Don Haraway would argue, are equally valid means of being more than just human. And when you take this kind of philosophy of cyborgs, this expanded definition uh, to its natural conclusion, there are none of us in theory that are not cyborg because we all in one way or another rely on something other than ourselves. We all in one way or another rely on technology or on animals, on plants for food, on um, the collective kind of world around us, society around us for support. Um, and guidance. And uh, it's very much an idea of togetherness and kinship that this kind of approach to cyborg theory pushes forward. I myself define myself as a cyborg. Um, I have a visual impairment. Um, you'll notice I have glasses, dark glasses, because um, the light is very painful for me and it worsens my vision. And I also use a cane and various accessibility features native to my um, computer's OS. Uh, and all of these allow me to navigate the sighted world, but I'm under no illusions that um, I would be able to do that without those bits of technology. So. In that way, I am a cyborg and my identity is kind of shifted to incorporate being cyborg um, and relying on these bits of technology as an extension of myself. Uh, and Professor Donna Haraway has a key phrase in all of this significant otherness, kind of a play on significant others. Um, the idea is that anything that we partner with to become cyborg is other than ourselves, but they're significant enough to us that we kind of meld and become one um, with them to kind of create an organism, a cyborganism <laughs> beyond just what each individual could produce on their own. Um, and I have, I'm ending here, just with a picture of, um, it's a parody of the creation of Adam and uh, the, the kind of technological hand mirroring and, and touching the human hand. And um, I just wanna start a discussion if we can on how uh, technology uplifts us and how we uh, create technology and how it can kind of harm us or better us and um, kind of question the way that we place technology on a pedestal um, almost like we would uh, a deity. But um, at the end of the day, there's another kind of, I'm proposing an alternative anthropological approach to it that views technology more as just another way of being um, and existing on the planet, another mode of being. Then a final thought, as we're faced with the climate crisis, with the death of privacy, with whatever is going on in Ukraine right now, um, it seems very much like we are living in a kind of eldritch hellscape. At least that's the feeling that I get, that we're faced with this unspeakable horror of how could we possibly move forward? And that's very much an idea that I feel every generation has felt to some extent or another, but maybe uh, Professor Donna Haraway has a way to approach this that can help us navigate through this uh, particularly difficult time. In her book, uh, Staying with the Trouble, Mankin and the Cthulhu Scene, Professor Donna Haraway recognizes this unspeakable, unimaginable, insanity-inducing horror that is the world. And she finds positive light in it by um, recognizing how terrible things are sometimes, but also recognizing the, um, the nourishing positive connections that we have with other organisms 
that we come together to become cy um, cyborgs with them. And she proposes that the only way forward is to make kin with others, to not just fend for ourselves, not just make technology and, and approach these kind of crises with just humans in mind, to also um, incorporate the, the wider ecosystem and the wider kind of techno system that we've made for ourselves, incorporate those into our um, humanitarian efforts. And the idea of staying with the trouble, with sitting in the discomfort, recognizing how kind of messed up a lot of things are, um, but also having a sense of togetherness and of kinship uh, is her approach to bettering the world, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. Here are some further readings. Um, this is basically a book report because Professor Donna Haraway is my favorite uh, author by far, but we have some other good people in there. Uh, we have Eduardo Cohn, uh, who wrote a really seminal piece in the anthropology of others. Um, and then we have modified living as a cyborg, which has uh, various first person accounts of people and how they incorporate technology to help them in one way or another, help them or hinder them or whatever it is. I wrote chapter nine um, about being blind and um, that really builds off the work that I previously discussed, but gives a kind of autobiographical approach to being cyborg in, um, in the world of, of the pandemic and uh, the climate crisis and all that good stuff. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if we have a few minutes, I would love to have a discussion, um, but equally let me know, uh, organizers, please, uh, what is the plan? Um, well, since we have two speakers and a full hour, I say maybe we have a discussion for five minutes or so. People, people are excited. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Miranda. That's awesome. Yeah, that was Thank amazing. you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I've just got one um, thing to offer that uh, I thought of in your thing. It's like, you know, not everything good, not everything bad. I, I think of my, my 14 year old daughter, right? So she's went through middle school these last couple of years in the pandemic, right? And middle school is especially for, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a woman, but from what I understand uh, that age in a woman is really difficult. Um, so like her being able to kind of be insulated from some of the like, you know, basically like, you know, jerk prepubescent men, um, <laughs> being able to like, you know, have a community with her friends um, through that time has actually been pretty nice. On the flip side of that, she wears her AirPods. So you can't even like talk to her in the morning to like say, hey, did you bring down your computer and charge it? You know, whatever. So it's mm -hmm. like, but it's like he's, she's using literally the exact same technology for those, two, for, you know, some of the, the best thing that was good for her and then just some of the, you know, frustrations that, that occur in our family as well, so. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And I, I feel that, technology, especially in, in this strange and unprecedented era that we find ourselves in, yet it has been precedented for two years at this point. Um, technology is very much a blessing and, and a way to kind of connect with others, um, but it also can be so isolating as we, as we see with the um, teen mental health crisis with social media um, and uh, well, not just teens, but everyone is negatively affected by that. And and, um, and yeah, there are definitely a lot of kind of positive and negative and, and neutral elements that we may or may not even be aware of until um, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, um, much in the same way that, you know, we look back at the 1950s and think like, how did we ever think that smoking was a good idea? <laughs> um, Yeah, it, it's funny. Can you I, I have... Speak about oh, cyborg feminism. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah. So, cyborg feminism, uh, the idea with that is basically an alternative name, like a shorthand for describing this whole 
um, opus that Professor Don Haraway and others have come up with. I, I should have defined that. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. So in feminism, there are many different waves. First wave feminism is like the suffragettes. Second wave feminism is um, uh, women being able to work. Third wave feminism is recognizing that uh, there are not just white middle-class women, there are women of, of um, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities. Fourth wave feminism, which is the one that we're debatably in now, is uh, feminism in the age of the internet, social media, and especially the Me Too movement, um, and kind of another sexual liberation movement um, hearkening back to the second wave. And then cyborg feminism is a kind of extension of that. So feminism, not just focusing on women, uh, not just focusing on humans, but trying to achieve equality and balance for um, not just for not just for human women, but for um, all sort of living and non-living entities. Um, so it's not so much a political movement as it is a philosophical movement. It hasn't really gone out of the realm of anthropology and the academy yet. Um, but we're seeing it move that way, um, especially with people trying to break down paywalls and make uh, academia more accessible to a wider audience. Um, we might be seeing it enter more into the popular discourse, um, I hope, <laughs> soon. <laughs>